Welcome today to our culture, the UAE culture. Welcome to Samim, the story of our culture. This is the only place in the expo that represents the UAE culture. This is, as you can see, the main entrance of Samim. We have the mountain environment. We have the desert and we have the coast. Of course, this is the floor, floor milling. As you can see, what she's doing is basically, this is a grindstone. So these are the grains that were growing in the mountains. We have wheat, we have barley, all types of different stuff. And what she does is she basically puts them, she places them in that circle in the middle. And all she does is twirls it around and floor comes out of the side. So this is how we used to eat back in the days as mountain people. These are the, this is basically a demonstration of the mountain homes back in the days. It's all made from locally sourced stones. And as you can see, these gaps here are intentional. It is to allow the air circulation, because back in the days, no air conditioning, none of that stuff. As you can see, if you touch here, place your hand here, it's a bit hot, but the further you go inside, the cooler it gets. That's the idea of constructing it. The roofs, we make them from what we call ad-du'un. Ad-du'un, which is basically palm tree leaves that strip, dried in the sun until they're brown, a bit tough and rugged, and then they're weaved in the form to construct this roof, which completely isolates. This is where the Bedouins used to live back in the days, right? So this is a brief demonstration of a tent and how it looks like. We call these tents Beit Ashar. Beit Ashar, which translates to house of here. Why do we call it that? Because it's actually woven from sheep, wool, and goats here to completely isolate and keep the Bedouins warm in winter back in the days. Because as ironic as it may sound, it actually gets pretty cold in the winter at the desert. What you see her doing here is called al khus said the weaving. So this is palm tree leaves that are used to construct basically basket and essential household items. Traditionally, it was the woman's duty back in the days to make those things. We are here right now in front of the ship, the dough that we call a sama, a sama, right? So this is basically a brief demonstration. Uh, they're actually, this is part of Samim, so they started constructing it from the beginning of the expo, and by the end it should finish and look like one of these decoys, but it's not the actual thing. This would never set sail. The actual thing takes about 10 to 12 months to construct and it requires a, a set of very, very talented craftsmen. As you can see here, we make it from different materials all over the world. Basically, we have the canvas made from Bahrain, the rope from Africa, and the wood, uh, teak and mango wood from India. As it is Emirati, it carries different spirits of other countries as well. It's a symbol of the UAE as well, just like the Falcon. The 20 dirham AEB note has a picture of it as well, just like the one dirham has of the Falcon. We would set sail for months and then hopefully come back with all the treasures, the, pearl, the pearls and the fish. And the pearls, by the way, we would virtually export everything we find. We never wore them to help grow our economy. Until the Japanese pearls, of course, came about. But luckily, within the same decade, we discovered oil. Back in the days, there was no Abu Dhabi, no, you know, uh, Dubai people, no. They would only refer to them as three different people from different areas. Mountain people, desert people, coast people. And all three of those would eventually meet up in Dubai Souk to trade with whatever they have. So the desert people would trade their camels, sheep, uh, dates, because palms grow at the desert. The mountain people would trade their honey, and the coast people would trade their fish and pearls. This is important because as the falcon is a symbol and it helps us feed 
in the desert, this helps us feed in the sea. Uh, my name is Ahmed Bukhash. I am uh, the chief architect and owner of Archidentity and the architect of the Expo Life Pavilion. Uh, the concept of the Expo Life Pavilion was to uh, showcase the Expo Live program, which basically um, takes innovation from all around the world and supports it in order for it to have a global impact. And we try to link that concept with, a, uh, with the UAE, its heritage. So this story tells about the, the meeting that was in 1968, where the late founding father, Sheikh Zayed and Sheikh Rashid, may God rest their souls. And they met in a northern tent. And also the form of the building tries to recreate the traditional tent. So you can see that there is the original tent and then we flipped it upside down and we abstracted into the origami form to create shading for people. And on the inside of the shade, we thought about how to bring the exhibition out rather than the exhibition in. If you have been to the pavilion and the ground floor, you will see a lot of these innovations such as um, we have some blocks that are made out of recyclable plastic and can be used in building buildings. Uh, and you have also some interesting um, uh, innovations to counter global climate change. So uh, basically it's a spray that they use a nano clay. So that clay is a top layer on the sand that protects the plant. So when they water it, it utilizes 50% less water. So these are some of the innovations. So in order for you to bring these innovations and showcase it to stakeholders to allow the idea to grow, this is what happens here. So they look at the potential of that idea. And after people walk through the exhibit, get inspired, they would come to the first floor here and they would sign a contract, which they will get the funding in order to allow that idea to grow and connect them with stakeholders. And that is the purpose of this uh, stage over here. And there's also a presentation space. So when they have other innovations, they would also make some, uh, you can say, B2B meetings. So they connect businesses together. You're within Al Sif development, which is also uh, very inspired by the Al Fahidi district. And it is basically the traditional area where we used to live, the original inhabitants. Actually, for me, I'm, I'm, you can say, the generation after the one with the childhood memories. As an architect, it inspires me to create style of architecture, which I have explained. And you can see one of the main traditional wind towers over there because we had a lot of natural wind coming and they did not have a lot of air conditioning. So they used the wind towers to bring in the natural ventilation. The building is very private because the household was always looking for their own privacy. So it is built on the perimeter of the plot and uh, it always has a courtyard. So it allows a lot of natural light and it allows the household to be living within there and to grow as a family. So they used to build part of the outside with the wall, but then as the family grew, they added inside and it started growing and growing from within the plot. And of course, it always has a courtyard. It has some trees and that is to create like a microclimate in the villa itself. So these are the trademarks of a traditional wind tower house. So I'm Dr. Robert Platt, I'm an architect and I'm an urban planner and I'm the Vice President for Visitor Experience for Expo 2020. Um, I started with the Expo team in 2015 when we were just working on the, on the master planning. So I was involved in all the, um, in the management of the design process for the master planning and the public realm areas and now I work with the visitor experience team to enhance the uh, quality of the visitor experience in all the public spaces. So we designed it as, as three separate um, intersecting circles and um, where the, it's, it's called a Venn diagram and where the circles all intersect is the, is the heart of the site and each circle then represents one of the, one of the sub themes and then each of those uh, zones, if you like, has a landmark building, which is the, the sub-theme pavilion. 
So you'll get the sustainability sub theme pavilion, the opportunity theme pavilion and the mobility pavilion. But it also is a, a kind of demonstration of the way uh, the UAE and Dubai in particular has become more, more and more significant in the international, in the world. And it's fantastic for us because it gives us an opportunity to show off the, off the country, of course. Um, which is why when we did all the public realm design, we looked at what makes our public realm unique to this place so that you know now that you are in, a, in, a, uh, in the UAE, which is why we have those stories and the medallions and we have those, the signage is that sadhu weaving idea. We've got drinking fountains, which are based on a, a local, a regional concept of hospitality where people would put drinking fountains outside their homes for travelers. The tradition is called Sabil. We've got uh, trees, um, the name of the tree is Gaf, G-H-A-F, and um, they're a tree that grows in the desert. Uh, I'm the man who is behind all the plantation uh, in Sidewide Expo. I believe this gaff is the uh, biggest gaff tree ever transplanted in the UAE. This is one of the native species uh, in UAE and the symbol of the, uh, UAE as well. Uh, well. This area was sand just two years ago. There was nothing here. And what we've created by in, in implementing these, these very old, um, highly tolerant, drought tolerant trees, we've created essentially a canopy for all this understory planting to exist. The, the selected um, adaptive type species. And you can hear the birds, you can, you can we're surrounded by, by all sorts of fauna and flora, and it's incredible. And this is essentially a, an example of bringing the desert and how it work, the ecosystem. Most deserts are actually very fertile places underneath. Then a lot of deserts, in fact, a lot of the Sahara Desert was once a forest many, many years ago. And you'll find petrified timbers and that under the sand. But if you look today, timber is, is a very sustainable material uh, in, in its, uh, if you farm it, uh, you know, if you, if you look at, it also has serious problems if you start just killing it. If you're creating farms of timber, it's a wonderful material, it's incredibly durable, and it's a, it's a warm material. This is a much nicer thing to sit on than a piece of concrete. You can manipulate it in many different ways. If you look at the Swedish pavilion, then they've created a forest somewhere else, uh, Belgium, for example, has a, has a facade. There's different, so many different ways you can use it as a material. It's not that readily available in here, of course. But then there's a lot of things that aren't readily available in a, in a lot of places. Marble, we still get most of our marble from Italy, you know, all over the world. So bringing the material in uh, for the versatility of it is quite reasonable in my view. In a way you can build with steel, but even building with steel you've got to make the steel. It's about mobility again, isn't it? You know, things are being shipped backwards and forwards all the time. And timber is a building material, I, I'd like to see more of it, quite honestly. Uh, timber frame housing is, is there because there's an abundance of, of that material most materials you've got to create in one form or another and a lot of logistics is about moving raw materials from one place to another. So I don't think the, the fact that we're in a desert environment needs to uh, preclude us from using a material that is available.
connecting minds, what does that mean, creating the future? It sounds good, but it almost sounds philosophical. Then we have a COVID pandemic. And suddenly that becomes really, really clear in my head because what the world had to connect um, to meet that challenge. And by connecting, that connection will remain and will get stronger. And therefore, you move into the future with much stronger ties. And when people talk about connecting minds and but all of that innovation, all of the technology, all the data should be about supporting the, the future of the planet. Uh, actually, you know, we're sad and happy at the same time. Sad that it's gone, of course, and happy that we learned a lot of lessons. And for us, we don't stop. As architects, we have continuous projects going on. And keep in mind that the pavilion we have designed, which is the Expo Life Pavilion, is actually was created to carry over the DNA of Expo 2020 into a new entity, which is Expo Live Initiative. We were speaking just a few days ago, the, one of the directors for Osaka uh, Expo was talking about how they want to continue that idea of connecting minds because they just feel that it's, be, it's so relevant and becoming more and more relevant as the days go on. It's always about people. If you think in sustainability terms, it's about all living things. It's not basically not just people. It shouldn't be human-centric. It should be about the planet, actually. And we are one inhabitant of the planet. So we started talking more and more about the future of the planet rather than the future of human beings because we're cohabiting with so many other things.